Hi everybody, welcome back. We're continuing chapter 5, Volcanoes, and this is our um, section 3 of 3 video lecture notes, and we're going to be talking about some of the hazards and some of the ways to mitigate risk with regards to volcanoes. Um, obviously, fire uh, is a hazard, not necessarily because the, the volcano creates fire itself, but of course it creates lava, and that hot lava um, can ignite pretty much anything. It can be um, close to thousands of degrees um, Celsius, and so n virtually nothing can, can withstand it. In fact, lava is molten rock itself, and so um, if rock's going to melt, it'll burn just about anything else. Uh, earthquakes are another hazard associated with volcanoes. A lot of times, um, volcanoes can cause earthquakes, and sometimes earthquakes can set off volcanoes. Um, in, the, in the case of Mount St. Helens, an earthquake preceded it, and it caused the volcano to erupt because of a, um, actually it caused a landslide, which caused the volcano to erupt. Speaking of landslides, all these are, are, are common secondary effects right here. Uh, stuff brought downhill under the influence of gravity. And uh, another effect that volcanoes can have is actually either, either short-term or even longer-term climate change. The debris, that is, the stuff that is thrown up into the air, the ash, the, um, the pyroclastic clouds, uh, even some of the gases can affect um, uh, the global temperatures. And I'm, I'm used to saying global warming, but it, it can actually bring about global cooling because it can reflect light away from, uh, from the Earth or block light um, from the sun so the Earth doesn't warm up as much as it normally does. All right, so what are some good things um, about volcanoes? We did talk about, uh, we did a discussion in class about some of the things that might be attractive about living near a volcano. It is true that there are some very good things associated with volcanoes. One of my favorite things is the coffee. Um, many coffees around the, the world are grown in volcanic soil. Uh, one of my favorite types, of course, you're probably going to guess this is from Hawaii, and you'd be right. It's called Kona coffee. It's, uh, if you're a coffee drinker, this is very smooth coffee. It's not, uh, it's not bitter or biting at all. It's, it's very, very tasty. Uh, and um, it's a result of being grown on the slopes of a volcano in Hawaii. Um, it can only be called Kona coffee if it's grown in a certain district. But um, a lot of the, the soils around those volcanoes are good for growing coffee. Also, pineapples, sugar cane, and grapes. These are all um, these are all plants that, that like uh, acidity in the soil, and um, uh, and so that can be a benefit of living near a volcano. A geothermal power is another one. All right, geo meaning earth, thermal meaning temperature. All right, so you can actually. In fact, some of you may even have geothermal in your homes where you drill down far enough and you access the Earth's heat. Well, near volcanoes, you don't need to drill down as far because um, obviously there's magma close to the surface. So you can actually generate energy simply by tapping into that power right there. Uh, another good thing that volcanoes produce is uh, mineral resources. A lot of these volcanic, um, th this volcanic activity can produce minerals that can be mined and used for, for resources. Gold and silver, obviously, they have uh, inherent value right there. Um, but other resources as well can be, um, uh, can be mined or in or around volcanoes. Uh, that vol All right, what else do volcanoes do? Well, they're just nice to look at, many of them. Um, recreation. You might recall Mount St. Helens was a beautiful place. All right, there is, um, there's a lake in front of it. Um, they, can, uh, they even had some hot springs near it that were heated volcanically, um, which may not sound very safe to you, but um, if it's a consistently just a, a warm... Uh, type of water that can be really nice to just just uh, dip into. Um, so lots of recreation areas around uh, around volcanoes, and even sometimes they can they can even create new land. Um, the Hawaiian Islands are a great example of that. Uh, in fact, new land is being created as we speak as new lava comes out of the ground. So there are actions of volcanoes. But the question is, how do we interact with volcanoes? Right here. Well, we don't do anything to affect them. All right, we don't cause volcanoes to happen. Uh, it's completely natural, but we do affect how many people are, affect, <laughs> are affected by volcanoes because of how many people are in the way. All right, you've got a volcano right here, minding its own business. It's going to erupt or not erupt based on its own time period. But the more people you put down here in the way of the volcano, of course, is going to increase 
how many people are affected. So simply us being in the volcano's way is creating a, um, a hazard to humans. So the best thing we can do is simply minimize um, loss of life by elsewhere. All right. What else can we uh, do? Well, we can create volcano forecasts, which, again, this is just sort of um, so it's a probabilistic statement, which means it's just sort of giving a, a general idea of is a volcano likely um, to erupt o over a certain time frame or in a certain place. But it's not a prediction, all right? A prediction is saying it will happen uh, at, at a certain time. A forecast is simply saying that it gives us a percentage of the likelihood to, um, for it to erupt. So we're not really at the point where we can um, predict or even forecast uh, vol uh, volcanic activities very accurately. Um, unless we're very, very close to the eruption. You might recall in, um, in 1980, Mount St. Helens right here had that bulge in the side of the mountain. Okay, that bulge was growing daily. And they could measure that in the last few days before it erupted, but no long-term um, no long -term forecast. So the more eruptions that take place, we do have, get more data on how to forecast them, but right now we're not really at a good place um, uh, to forecast very accurately. Well, what kind of things do for, does forecasting involve? Well, seismic activity. We mentioned how earthquakes are very closely related to volcanoes. Um, sometimes water conditions, um, water tables, that is the, the water from underground, can be affected by nearby volcanoes. And if that water quality changes, then um, that means there may be volcanic activity. Um, sometimes we have, we have things called tilt meters, all right, um, or swelling of the volcano. That's what was going on up here, all right. As the volcano was swelling and, and, um, and tilting, we have in instruments that can pick that up and tell us what, so what parts of it are, um, are growing or expanding and likely to, um, to erupt. Certain gases that come out of the volcano, as, that, um, as certain gas types increase, it may increase the probability of a volcano. And also just the geologic history. All right. If you have an idea of the history of a volcano, you have an idea of how likely it is or what kind of time frame it's likely to erupt. So, sometimes um, earthquakes can give us a kind of a last minute prediction of an eruption. Um, we call them swarms. Um, in fact, uh, just recently, now this is uh, 2014, but just recently there's been swarming of earthquakes going on in northern Nevada. It's not near a volcano, but maybe it could be an indicator that a volcano would be erupting out of the ground right there. But um, earthquake swarms, that is, lots of little earthquakes in a certain area, okay, uh, are indicating that something is going on underground. Sometimes that's an indication that a volcano is going to erupt. So as we measure, um, uh, we measure water and we measure um, the thermal properties of the volcano, we have um, the groundwater level, like I mentioned before, sometimes changes or the actual chemical properties of it change. Um, satellites help us to measure um, the heat coming off of a volcano. So we can get thermal imaging from a satellite in space. Uh, a few slides back in the previous section, we showed how in Mount St. Helens there was that, uh, um, there was that bulge in the middle of the otherwise snow-covered crater, and that bulge was not snow-covered, which probably meant that a lot of heat was coming off of it, which means the snow was going to melt. So sometimes a melting snow in a certain area will indicate that there is, um, that there is a, a thermal activity going on. All right. So all these things predict, or at least lead to a forecast, that a volcano is going to erupt right here. This uh, diagram simply indicates that as, um, as lava moves up towards the surface, it creates more fractures in the rock. And the more fractures enable it to rise up to the surface. Now the lava kind of squeezes through rock right there and, and kind of breaks the rock more and more. So it kind of makes its own conduit. That's the term right here. Conduit simply means pipe. But it kind of makes its own path or makes its own pipe up to the surface. Right there. All right, so what else can we do to measure um, the likelihood of a volcano erupting? Well, like I said, we have tilt meters, all right? And um, think of it like, I'll think of it like this. Um, if you had, and this is a 
very basic form of tilt meter. All right, if you have a cup filled with water, all right, what is indicating that that's tilting? Well, of all of a sudden, you see your cup and the water level in it is kind of like that sideways. Well, then that tells you that your um, that your cup you have you, that you have is tilting. So. Um, obviously, they're much more sophisticated than that, but tilt meters just indicate how much the ground that this uh, instrument is buried in is tilting, and that tells us what parts of the volcano are swelling. I mentioned some kinds of uh, gas emissions earlier on. CO2 is a big one, um, sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide are other gases that, that can be poisonous to us, but as we monitor those gases, those are telltale gases that the interruption could be happening. Uh, and of course, like I said before, the history of the volcano that tells us uh, the likelihood or, or, or the pattern or the, the frequency with which that volcano is going to erupt. Kind of just shows how the land swells and expands um, leading up to an eruption. So if you have tilt meters in, in here and in here right there, as that swells outwards, those tilt meters are going to tell us um, how, the, uh, how the mountain itself is uh, when it could erupt. So what if it does? Um, uh, it is concluded that a volcano is likely to erupt soon. What are the steps that we take? Well, the USGS, that is the United States Geological Survey, is um, is responsible for sending out a, uh, a notification. All right, and so they'll send out various different alert levels based on well, just the probability of it um, of the volcano um, erupting. Normal is green. I guess I should write this in. And green right here, all right? So an advisory basically tells the population that something is going on uh, right there, so just be aware. Watch, a volcanic watch indicates that, um, and this is the code level orange, that people are put on, on standby, and a warning, which is red, means that there's a very high likelihood of a, of a volcano erupting um, sometime in the near future. Now it's interesting because uh, time in geologic terms is kind of relative. A near future could be 100 years <laughs> from now, um, but um, it basically is we just need to get the, the word out to people that there could be something happening and they need, they need to be prepared to move um, if, if something does really start to happen. All right, I'm not going to go through this whole, um, whole slide right here, but there are various different... Um, uh, different color codes, like I mentioned before, that kind of gives you give you little details as to what each um, what each warning means. So again, we have normal, we've got advisory, we've got a watch, and we've got a warning right here. This is just the detail system. All right. So, um, how do people react to threats of volcanoes right here? Well, it depends on how they perceive them. All right. Uh, I mentioned a guy in the, the last video section by the name of Harry Truman. Okay, not the president, but he was just uh, an old fellow named Harry Truman, and he was under the impression that this volcano would never hurt him. He was um, he lived at the base of the volcano in a lodge, and um, people interviewed him and he was kind of a colorful character and uh, he was very vocal about not ever moving and he perceived the volcano and he had this kind of understanding. Um, it didn't turn out very much in his favor but that was his perception. Other people perceive volcanoes to be very very dangerous and not live anywhere near them. Um, what's the truth? Well it could be somewhere in the middle right there but how we perceive volcanoes leads to how we respond to them um, which is this right here. How we perceive them leads to how we adjust the volcano hazards. Now, once a volcano is erupting, one of the things that can affect people is lava, and sometimes we respond to lava by trying to control it. Um, like I said, it, it melts pretty much anything, but one thing that kind of resists melting is, um, is soil. Uh, soil is full of water, all right, and what we sometimes do is we pile up soil in an attempt to divert a lava flow so here's a lava flow right here coming towards it on the ground. That may divert the lava flow around it. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But that's why we say that there are attempts to control 
lava flows. So this is what's uh, how we respond to it. Why? All right. So why do some people live near volcanoes? Well, maybe they're born there. All right. People have a pretty close connection to the places where they're born. Um, maybe family members have passed away and are buried there. Um, so you wouldn't want to move away from that. Um, like I said before, volcanoes can provide fertility. That is, the, the land can be very, um, very fertile. The volcanic ash uh, makes very, very fertilized soil. Um, maybe people just, like I said before, Harry Truman believes that, well, this volcano will never harm me, or they know that geologic time periods are very long periods of time, and so uh, what's the chance I'm going to be in, in the way? Some people think that the benefits of a volcano are more, uh, way more than the likelihood of the volcano erupting. Um, and that also, they may not, just may not be able to, to move. Okay, it's probably cheaper living near a volcano because you've got some some degree of risk. Maybe homes near a volcano are going to be less expensive, so maybe they just can't afford to move somewhere else. So how do we um, get people uh, aware of volcanic hazards and know the risks? Well, like we said before with tsunamis, we just need to educate people, um, knowing the telltale signs that a volcano could erupt. Um, and so we need communication between scientists and emergency personnel and educators like, like myself and students like yourselves and the media and all that needs to have a lot of um, talk back and forth so people know the hazards and know how to respond. All right. So how do we respond? All right. If we have a volcano warning and it's, it's time to do something about it. Well, the biggest response right there is just evacuation. All right, get people out before the eruption. And that's what they were, they were trying to do in Mount St. Helens. Uh, but some people, like I said before, Harry Truman just did not want to go. Um, and there's also something kind of psychological about a volcano wiping out your home. Um, right now in, in Hawaii, there, there's lava that has actually come towards a, uh, uh, a town and has overrun a cemetery. That's, that's a pretty personal thing. If you've got people buried in the cemetery, now there's lava over it. There's no way you can access their grave anymore. So people need to be able to psychologically losses they incur from a volcano. So how else do we try to control lava? Well, like I mentioned before, building up walls. Um, and oftentimes those walls are made up of dirt or soil, which contains water. But also, this has been um, used in Iceland. Uh, we try to chill the, the lava hydraulically. That just means hydra anything means with water or fluid. And so if you hit it with cold enough fluid, maybe the front of the lava uh, will, st will, f will kind of harden and stall and prevent the lava from behind it, lava behind it from actually coming forward. So they, um, in Iceland, they, they tried to cool the, the lava with fire hoses and, um, uh, and even bring snow up against it. So um, that the, the, the lava would, uh, would harden in place. They even brought pipes in that, that had water flowing through them. All right. Now, as long as water was flowing through it, the pipe didn't melt because the water was carrying away the heat from, from the lava. Um, but all these different things are used as a, uh, well, to hopefully try to divert or stall towards people's homes right here. All right. So um, this picture up here in the upper upper left looks pretty daunting. Okay, there's giant fissures, F-I-S-S-U-R-E, giant fissures of lava shooting out right there. It doesn't seem like it would be very possible to control that, um, but they try. And here we have firefighters trying to control the, the front of the lava flow with, by cooling it with, um, with water. And, uh, and down here we've got a, another scene of lava flowing as well. So all these are um, responses. So here now we have Eifialiakul, as I'm going to, going to call it. Um, and this is the modern day volcano that is, uh, that is still active and, uh, and is still erupting right, right now. As you recall, it's in Iceland. Iceland is at the um, middle of the mid-ocean ridge. You could say it's uh, over a hot spot, um, but it's also at a plate boundary, that is diverging plates. So every three to four years, this volcano, Eia, is... Um, uh, has been active, all right, and so the good news is that it's often enough that this eruption is what we call effusive, effusive. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that it's just letting off steam. 
Um, yes, it is erupting, um, and it is creating some uh, havoc for air travel because you've got ash and stuff in the air. And it is creating problems, but it's not a super violent volcano. It's just letting off enough steam, for lack of a better word, for the volcano to kind of go back to sleep for a short time before it kind of lets off a little bit of steam. The last thing we want is for a volcano to be quiet for a long time and build up and build up and build up and build up pressure um, and explode all at once. We don't want that. So uh, EIA has a volcano, exp uh, volcano explosivity index of no more than one. And remember, now it goes up to 10. So um, that's pretty safe. Um, the volcano is pretty localized, which means it just sort of happens in one area and doesn't affect a, a huge area, aside from the ash falling. Um, but in 2010, it was a more major eruption. All right, so um, these were all things that were, uh, that were leading up to the 2010 uh, eruption. Um, what told them that, the, that something was about to happen in 2010? Well, we mentioned before the seismic activity. All right, earthquake, earthquake swarms were becoming more shallow and closer to the surface um, rather than deep down. Closer to the surface probably means that magma is coming up to the surface. We had tilt meters detecting tilt. That is, the, um, the, the, the ground was, was, uh, was bulging upwards, okay, and the ground was being deformed. That is deformation, five millimeters per day. Now, that doesn't seem like very much, but in, um, in geologic terms, that's quite a bit of deformation that told geologists that something was going to happen right here. So here's Iceland. Um, down here we have these two volcanoes. This is Eya right here and next to it's a slightly larger sister is Katla. Um, but uh, those volcanoes are still still very active right now and here's a close-up of it. Oops, zoom in here. There we go. There's a close-up of it. And um, uh, and both of these uh, volcanoes are just surrounded by all kinds of tilt meters and GPS stations and um, hydrological stations measuring the water quality so that if anything starts happening with these volcanoes, um, seismic sensors and um, geologic sensors are going to pick it up and hopefully predict it so that people can stay out of harm's way. All right, so this is all the, um, all the earthquakes that led up to the 2010 eruption, so not very much going on right here and then leading up to 2000, March of 2010, more and more and more earthquakes. So there was quite a spike in these last few months. So the earthquakes can be a volcano is going to erupt. So this, um, uh, this, volcan well, this volcano uh, Ea in, uh, in Iceland generally is effusive. That's, again, we said that before. That means just kind of letting off enough steam to go back to um, being quiet again. One thing that really drew people in, that there is, we call it a fire curtain, or sometimes a fissure. Okay, uh, fissure means a, a, a crack where, where lava shoots out and kind of like a wall. And people came to check that out, and it was pretty good photography. I'll show you in, in the next picture or so. Um, but in 2010, it was something of, a, of an explosive eruption. I guess enough pressure had built up that... Um, there was damage caused, and people were forced to evacuate. And um, this, this column of ash actually shut down air travel in Europe for, um, for several weeks, um, or at least until the sky was clear enough. So look at that right there. That's pretty cool. That's, uh, that's a lava flow. And as I mentioned before, sometimes lava will shoot up in great big, in a great big walls before kind of coming back down, we would call that a fissure or a lava curtain that shoots up right there. So that's some good photography right there, and it certainly brought people in. But, uh, of course, that lava is... Uh, the, um, uh, the volcanic ash, however, did travel much further. Uh, it, it blew towards Europe, and I showed you some maps earlier on about how the, um, the winds carried this volcanic ash towards Europe, and there were zones all around Europe for, for a week or so that you couldn't fly in because, well, if this ash is in the air, it gets sucked into your jet uh, engine, um, it can really wreak havoc, and so um, you don't want to be flying in the middle of that. Of course, Iceland itself was kind of spared this ash because winds blew it away from Iceland and towards Europe. 
But um, some places in Iceland were covered by a couple inches of ash, and uh, there was some places that actually had complete darkness even in daytime because the ash blotted out the sun. But for the most part, um, Iceland was, uh, was pretty much spared um, aside from the, the local area right there. It wasn't until six months later that the area was considered safe and the people could return to business as usual. So this volcano in, in, in Iceland and this shows all the air travel, I'll circle this in, I don't know, in blue, all the air travel was affected uh, right in the center of Europe, and Iceland is completely fine. Now, this volcano exists right down, in fact, I'll zoom in, right down at the bottom corner there of Iceland. So if the wind is blowing offshore, then most of Iceland is going to be safe. But um, most, much of Europe was not, and so they had to, all the red countries right there had total closure of air travel, and some had partial closure of air travel. So um, that's just one of the the effects of this, uh, this ash that flows out from, from volcanoes and goes up into the atmosphere. So that was our last bit of notes, uh, our section three of three. And, um, and if you have any questions, come see me. But um, hopefully this is helpful to you. And if you, if you need to watch it, of course, it's going to be here for you to check out over and over. So um, that is it for uh, section three of chapter five. The last little bit the, uh, of notes are summaries, and, uh, and we can go over those in class. But this is, uh, this is the wrap-up of our volcano chapter. So I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And again, if you have any questions, come see me in class. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.